Hello, welcome to the Ilone Show. I'm your host, John Milone. And in this episode, I've brought in a regular Asparagus, who will join us eventually. Or not, who knows. As for our guest, he's from Kissimmee, Florida. He is a retired chef turned food and travel blogger. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dennis Litley. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. It's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, I'm in Kissimmee, Florida, but where are you at? Absolutely. So... How's life? Uh, life is pretty good. I can't complain. It's a, a beautiful day in Florida. And um, it's nice doing what you love to do. Okay, great. And uh, have you been up too much recently? Uh, well, actually, I had back surgery last week. So I guess that's the biggest news in my life uh, just recently. Okay. All right. So uh, t- tell me more about what you do. Okay. Well, I, I was a chef during most of my life. And after leaving the restaurant industry, I, I went on to feed executives and, and business dining. And from there, I, I ended up at a school as my last stop. And I'd never fed kids before. I didn't know what to do other than just feed them the kind of food that I knew. And uh, it turned out to be a, a marriage made in heaven. It was an all-girls Catholic high school. And uh, they just loved the food. They loved me. And... Uh, at one point, I decided to start a culinary program there and train my own staff so I didn't have to hire temps in the kitchen when I had functions. And that's kind of how I became a blogger. Through through starting the program, I decided to start blogging. This was back in 2009. So my girls had a resource to find, to find me online and uh, find the recipes and we could talk back and forth. And uh, that never worked out that way. They just wanted to come in my office and talk to me. And, uh, but I started getting followers. And uh, one day I had a follower in New Zealand and one in Singapore. And I officially became a blogger that day when my, my reach had expanded past my immediate family and friends. Wow, incredible. And what kind of food did you make during your time as a chef? Uh, I did a lot of Italian dining. I had been trained as an apprentice. I, I did go to school and, and got a degree in food science, but I was not a trained culinarian. Uh, I did it the old fashioned way by having executive chefs, you know, just pretty much abuse me for a couple of years while I learned my trade. And uh, I, I listened. It was something that I was just naturally drawn to and felt connected with and uh, not to be bragging, but I did it really well. And that, that kind of shaped my life and, and the direction it was going. And just cooking has been who I am, what I do, and, and a lot of different iterations of how I've done it over the years. Okay, nice. Is, it, is there any kinds of dish that you always make often or any kinds of dishes that you like making and enjoy eating? Oh, yeah. Um, I love pasta dishes of any kind. Uh, being a, a restaurant chef on the coast, I had access to fresh seafood continuously. So I'm I'm very fond of pasta dishes that have seafood. My wife's favorite is just clams and pasta. And uh, they're very easy to get these days. There's so many aquaculture uh, farming done with with clams that are good quality. And uh, you can find them in supermarkets. So you can find them at restaurant supplies. And uh, we, we have that pretty much once a week because she loves it, and it's a lot cheaper than going out to eat. And it's one of the dishes that's so easy to make, it almost cooks itself. It really is. Uh, and that's one of the ones we have quite frequently. And, and for me, just, uh, like I said, anything over pasta, whether it's chicken or seafood in a red sauce or uh, garlic and oil sauce or an Alfredo sauce or just something I've come up with by blending different things together, you know, it just um, it, it's easy to do. It's something that most people don't realize. You know, this is a chef. This is how we kind of come up with specials. We're just throwing stuff in a pan and seeing how it comes out and then figuring out how to adjust it. So, and, and basically it's adjusting to flavor profiles that you enjoy eating or the person you're serving, you know, enjoys eating. So, you know, that transfers over to home cooking and, it's, uh, I used to always tell my girls in class, you know, this isn't rocket science. This is food. It's, it's not supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to just be fun. And, and you cook with foods that you like eating. Okay, nice. Now, 
were there any dishes that required the least amount of ingredients? Well, th there's quite a few, you know, and I love French cooking and some other styles, but some of them rely a lot on sauces and, and, and uh, different things to make the dish more appealing. But my philosophy is, you know, if, if the meat or the seafood doesn't taste good by simply using olive oil, salt, and pepper on it, there's probably something wrong with it. I mean, sauces are great to embellish it, but when it comes down to it, a nice piece of fish, either cooked in the oven, in a saute pan, uh, you know, it, it or on the grill, doesn't need a lot. You know, you're, like I said, a little seasoning, rub it down with a little olive oil, and it should be, it should taste really fresh. Uh, so a lot of the, the, the recipes I make aren't overly complicated. They don't have a lot of ingredients like clams and linguine. It's clams, pasta, olive oil, garlic, crushed red pepper, black pepper, and uh, fresh basil. That's it. So, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, I, I go out in the garden, pick some basil and chop it up and everything else is just in the pantry. It's so simple to make. Wow. Okay. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, is there any particular dishes you don't make often or you don't like making? I've never been real fond of calamari or octopus. Um, it's not that I don't like making it. I don't like eating it. So um, I, I've made during my career as a chef, I made a lot of calamari, fried calamari or, uh, you know, cooking it in over pasta and different things. No, but it's it's never been my favorite flavor. And I, in fact, I, I would not even look at octopus. And we were in Barcelona and they took me on a food tour. And my rule is when someone's taking me on a food tour, or they're cooking for me, I taste everything. And they served me a piece of grilled octopus that absolutely blew me away. Now, I unfortunately, I didn't get them to share the recipe with me on how they grilled it or what seasonings they use. It was very simple, but it was incredibly flavorful. So, uh, but I would think those are items that have never really been on my top 10 list of cooking or eating. Okay. What were the funniest moments you had as a chef? <laughs> uh, there were quite a few. I mean, we always enjoyed a good laugh over things each other did, but... Uh, Probably one of the funniest things that happened was I was moving a pot of marinara sauce. And this restaurant I worked in had a very low ceiling. It was maybe six inches higher than my head. And I the pot slipped out of my hands and it was like a cannon had exploded. And the sauce went upwards, hit the ceiling and came right back down and covered me. And my staff was off to the side trying to control their hysterics and i just looked at them and said just go ahead and laugh yeah it was so, so then we're all hysterical at that point and i'm i'm cleaning up and they're helping me clean up but uh that was one of those points and it's it's you know it goes to show you you, you can be serious uh, but you while you're laughing at, at other people's funny things they do you have to make sure that you'll let them laugh at the funny things you do too okay okay that's cool so what got you thinking about sharing your culinary expertise to the entire internet? Well, when I was a, in the chef in restaurants, those were the days of very guarded recipes and secrets. And there was no way I was going to let you know how I made this. Um, when I started teaching the culinary class, I, I kind of said, you know, I have to let them know everything. I have to let these girls know, you know, tips, secrets, tricks, things that I'm doing. So, you know, I wasn't trying to create chefs. I was trying to give them the life skills to cook for their family, you know, when they when they finished school and went on through college and, and had a family. Um, and I think at that point, it, it just occurred to me that my recipes were too good not to be shared and demystifying cooking any way that I could do that would go a long way with, with letting just normal, you know, workers, people that have jobs, nine to five jobs or whatever jobs they have, that when they get home, 
they didn't have to order out. They didn't have to microwave food that they could very easily cook in their kitchens and make foods that they really enjoyed eating, you know, at, at a lot less than buying, going out to eat and, and a lot better quality in most, most cases too. So at that point, it was like, I just became determined that all my recipes would be perfect. And you know, someone trying it would make it really well. It would come out really well. And the more I did it, the more I wanted to share. And the more I shared, it was just like, a, a, you know, became a, a ritual for me. Uh, I wasn't really good at taking pictures when I first started and, or writing the blog posts, but, you know, the recipes were always solid. So, you know, over the years, we've transitioned and learned to take better pictures and write a blog post that's more helpful than just telling stories. And it's been a whole process. But, you know, I, I just think it's important for something, well, not to die with me. I mean, I, I did create a good portion of them on my, my own, but, you know, there's ones that I'm sharing and people need to pass this on. Food is like a really major part of life and it's a, a bonding experience that you know we can share with others and we become friends over food so creating delicious food you know that has been my my real number one goal in life and, and sharing it and helping people uh see that they can do it too incredible what is your favorite way to cook my favorite way to cook is saute uh, because it's fast I can create a dish in a pan in about 10 minutes. And I always tell people with saute, your options open up exponentially because I can look in the refrigerator and see what I have, what kind of vegetables I have, uh, what type of meats or seafood I have. I can think about how I want to cook them. I can make a pan sauce around what I'm cooking. And, you know, it's easy to, to make a side dish for it. You know, like I said, I love pasta. So a lot of it ends over pasta or it might be rice or it might be risotto or I might make potatoes on the side, but uh, saute will always be my favorite simply because it's, it's so easy and you can adjust the flavor profile so many ways and, and make a dish. Like, you know, I always tell people, you know, if I'm making shrimp and broccoli, but you don't like broccoli. Well, leave the broccoli out. What do you like? Asparagus? Do you like spinach? Is there something else you could put in there to go with it? You know, it's it's easy to adapt. And that kind of cooking just makes it really simple. There, There's guidelines more than there's anything etched in stone recipe-wise. Cool. Now, to what extent did you work as a chef? Did you work at a restaurant? Were you cooking privately for our family or whatever? Well, I started out when I was 12 flipping burgers and I, w I worked at a little hamburger joint. And by the next year, I was the manager of the joint because <laughs> I was an overachiever in those days. Um, and then from then on, I went on to working. I worked at a nursing home and I'd always enjoyed cooking. I always, my mother was a nurse and she worked nights, so if I was home during the day and she was asleep, I had to fend for myself, So, and, and I love to eat, so you know, cooking was something that came naturally to me that I enjoyed doing, uh, but I worked in a nursing home, and I had a woman that worked for me that was just brilliant. She was there to make extra money for her grandchildren to get them things, and she had been retired, and she showed me some nuances and techniques and some things that I really didn't know and hadn't seen before and it piqued my interest and I, I kind of got tired of working there after a few years and a, a salesman who was my friend had said you know this guy's looking to train somebody you won't make any money but you know it can be a lot of fun a lot of hard work and you'll learn an awful lot so yeah I spent a, like I said I spent a few years training with him and uh, trained me to be a chef and taught me all the ins and outs and taught me how to curse properly and uh, a lot of different things as we went along. Uh, but really it just came down to something that connected with me in the process. Uh, there, there had been a big German chef there who was a CIA trained culinary Institute of America trained uh, just really, really good. And, but he didn't like to cook. He liked every other aspect 
of the job and he did it very very well but it just make actually making the food was not on his list of top, top things to do and when i kind of took over that role he encouraged it and helped me and nurtured me and and really brought me to a point where i could end up running the restaurant and uh, that was kind of how the story unfolded cool cool and did you did you ever work with other chefs throughout your oh, time? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I worked for corporations and um, I'd have chefs under me uh, working in different capacities. Uh, I was a director a lot of times, too, and I would have groups of chefs or we do big functions. And we had a regional chef who would come in and I was under his control as well as every other chef in the region. And uh, we worked together creating you know, a lot of food. I, I worked the largest tenant event in North America at the time we fed 20,000 people and um, we had quite the group of chefs for that event okay cool cool so what do you like being a chef it's it's a way for me to express myself it's it's the one it's my artistic talent you know I, I can't draw a round circle uh, I can take a pretty good picture now but you know it's not my creative outlet. My creative outlet has always been creating food and making dishes that would make people moan when they ate them, you know, that would would make people happy and, and give them a, a good sense of fulfillment by eating, you know, and, and it, it's just when you can bring some kind of joy to people through that. And, you know, I, for me, that's kind of magical. And that I think is probably the best part of being a chef is just seeing those smiling faces, those happy people and, and eating something that you created. Yeah. It, it's a good way to, to live. It's a good way to make a living. You know, it's, it's got its downsides too, where there's some ugly days, but you know, if you can stay positive and focused and, and you get a lot of, of input, a lot of positive input as a chef. So it's a good place to be. Okay. Nice. And in terms of the, the the blog that you you post out, mm -hmm. are, are they are they in any way monetized, or do you do oh, yeah. like oh okay, yeah um, yeah when I started, there were not a lot of people reading me, and uh, along the way when I had well actually when I retired from the kitchen due to a series of injuries and we, we moved to Florida, um, I I had time to work on it more and to work on social media more and. I, I was fortunate enough to join Google Plus, and I, I had drank the Kool-Aid. I always tell people I became a, a pluser, and uh, I was using Google the way they wanted it to be used, and they had recommended me. I was on the follow list with Anthony Bourdain, Rachel Ray, Martha Stewart, uh, Emeril Lagasse, all these, Gordon Ramsay, all these big-time chefs, and here was Chef Dennis, and I could, for the life of me, couldn't figure that out. And, uh, but I was using the platform they, the way they wanted. I was teaching classes, live classes on Google Hangouts. I was sharing things consistently. Uh, I was answering questions, you know, so they rewarded me with that. And at that point, things started to build for me and progress for me. And I guess about five years ago, things really started to turn around. And I monetized through ads as pretty much any blogger does. And it's a way to keep me working, to keep me happy too, because not only am I doing something I love, you know, I'm making some money at it. And uh, it's always, there has to be some return or at one point you just kind of say, forget it and go sit on the, on the couch and watch TV. So this keeps me motivated and uh, keeps me sharing new recipes and helping people. Uh, I also write recipes for companies. I work for uh, a bunch of different companies and they'll have me create something for them specifically using their product and share that out. So you know, that's, that's kind of the way personal appearances. Uh, I did a commercial for one product. They flew me out to Los Angeles for the day and filmed for 12 hours. Uh, it was kind of crazy. So yeah, it's, it's been an interesting trip. Great. And what have been the high and low points of being a chef? Mm. Well, the high points are always when, things go as planned. Life is good. Product comes in, all your help comes in. Uh, the night runs fairly smoothly. 
nobody gets cut, burnt, or maimed in any way. And it's just a good night sharing the process with people that you enjoy working with. Uh, the low points, of course, are when things don't go as planned. If you're having a bad day and it starts to spill over into your work, you know, it can get ugly. Uh, chefs are always known for being, you know, alcoholics or, you know, drug abusers or womenizers or, you know, a variety of cursors or just generally not nice people. But, you know, I always say, you know, there's usually a reason we're in that kind of mood. Uh, it's generally not our fault, but it's something that's easy to fall into if you're not careful. And again, staying positive and finding positive reinforcement uh, by creating things that people you know, will enjoy eating is always a good way to keep your focus and keep things going well. But, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong in any given day. And as the chef, as the, the leader in the kitchen, it's your responsibility to make things right. And some days it's just very difficult. Okay. If your life was a meal, what would it be? <laughs> if my life was a meal, what would it be? Well, it would be a, a complete meal. Uh, it would start with some garlic oysters that are just broiled with a nice fresh chopped garlic and olive oil and seasonings. It would go on to a, a first dish of pasta with a rosa sauce uh, with possibly some vegetables and some mushrooms and some tomatoes, fresh tomatoes. And oh, we'll see what else falls in the pan as I'm making it. And then the entree would be a really nice piece of grouper fish just broiled fresh grouper broiled perfectly with just salt pepper and olive oil so you can taste the fish and it'll just flake off and the, the flavors will just explode in your mouth and then for dessert my all-time favorite and my all-time biggest blog post of all time tiramisu and that would just be the perfect meal of my life wow Amazing. Do you Thank travel? You. <laughs> anytime. Do you travel often? Uh, before COVID, I did. Um, I was a travel blogger. And I found that one, one day I had a call from a friend and said they're looking for bloggers to write about this one property on the coast, Atlantic coast in Florida. And I said, you know, I'm not a travel blogger. She goes, oh, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a blogger. Just, just put your application in. And I didn't hear from them. And didn't hear from them. Finally, I got an email back. Says, "Oh, we'd love to have you. Um, we this is the week we're doing it." So I said, "Sure." And I was like the last one signed on, so I got the worst room in respects of where it was and, and size and everything. It was on the third floor, uh, two twin beds. It wasn't a real pretty room. They were renovating and they were going from first up to third, and they hadn't gotten a third yet. And they had put in these nine foot sliding glass doors that they had gotten in a place in Europe and they were installed, they install these in all their rooms. And I'm looking at the ocean from the doors and just, it's just a gorgeous third floor then was a good place to be because I had a great view and uh, looking out and I turned to my wife and says, you know, I can do this. If I write about places, they'll send me there. So I, I had a really good relationship with a hotel group in Florida, and we traveled all over Florida, uh, staying and writing about their places and all the things you could enjoy in the cities, or the towns they were in, and the, the just great relationships I made with all these independent hotel owners, small hotel owners. And at one point, I'm enjoying this, and I got an email from Viking Cruises that uh, said, you know, you fit our demographic. Would you like to travel with us? And my first thought was, yay, I'm old. Okay. And uh, the other thought was, wow, I finally hit the big time Viking. Uh, we started traveling with them. And then another company picked me up. And then another company picked me up. And then another company picked me up. And uh, because I was a, a food blogger and people generally knew why they wanted to travel to an area, but food was not always high on the list of what, what you can eat or what you would enjoy while you were there. So I was telling the culinary side of the travel, saying, you know, you know, you're going to Paris for these reasons, or you know, you're going to Rome for these reasons. This is what you're going to eat while you're there. And this is what you're going to look for while you're there. And uh, I had such a large following on my food side of the blog that it transferred over 
to a lot of impressions when I would travel and I would just blow most normal travel bloggers out of the water in terms of, of the followers I had and the response I would get. So we learned to travel and love travel and we would generally spend six to eight weeks in Europe uh, just going to different places and, and, and meeting people and just loving life. Okay. Now, if you switched lives with someone, who would it be and why? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm pretty happy what I'm doing. But um, if I could switch lives with someone, it might, it might be someone uh, like Bill Gates or, or someone else that's uh, incredibly filthy rich. And uh, so I had an opportunity to try and do more. I, know, I mean, I know they do a lot with their money, but to try and do some things that I think are areas that the world could use some help in with the money. You know, I do what I can, but I am nowhere near the philanthropist that, uh, that they can, that they are. And uh, with the incomes that I have, with the revenue streams that I have, but uh, that would probably be the only reason just so I could do more good uh, in the world. But other than that, I don't know. I, I, I would like to switch places with maybe the 20 year old of myself, knowing what I know. And, and enjoy the, enjoy some much better years. Oh, yes, absolutely. What's the best way to start the morning? Coffee. Black coffee and lots of it. Really? Is, is that it? Just black coffee? Black coffee. I mean, you know, uh, black coffee, lots of it. And, well, I, I have a ritual. Okay. I get okay. my coffee while well, I drink water first. It's because you get old. Water is very important. It's, it's important all the time, but as you get old, it's even more important. So I drink lots of water. Uh, I make my coffee. I come into my office and I start the ritual. And the ritual is to see uh, what I made, how much traffic I had the day before and how much I made because of that traffic. So that sets a very positive spin on the day. I, I read my emails and look for any fires that have started that I need to put out. And then uh, from that point on, I just try and figure out how I'm going to spend the day creating. If I'm cooking that day, what I'm cooking, uh, shopping, uh, getting ingredients shipped over to me. And uh, just so the best day always starts with coffee and lots of it, though, just to get, get myself perked up. Cool, cool. Do you like spicy food? To an extent, I like to still feel my mouth at the end of the meal. I, I'm not as big of a spicy eater. I, I like the philosophy of something being spicy without necessarily being incredibly hot. There's a balance. Uh, I'm half Mexican, but I, I will say I'm not a very good Mexican because I do not like really hot food. It's, it's just, it's, it's got to be flavorful. And if you're going just for heat, you know, there's, you know, there's people that love that. That's fine. But that's not something I, I enjoy. Uh, but if it's spicy, you know, with, with something spicy, I learned a long time ago, is you just never stop eating. It's when you have something that you really like the flavor of, but it's a little too spicy. You just have to keep eating constantly because once you stop, that's when the heat starts. And then you can't you can't really make it go away at that point. So you want to get through the meal, savor it, enjoy it, and then get ready for uh, the heat to build. Okay. Uh, that's all we have for this episode. It was great having you here, Dennis, talking oh, about thanks. your life. Yeah, anytime. And until next time, stay tuned for more.